At this point, we've been introduced to two models of electrons and atoms and molecules that seem to be at odds with one another. First is the quantum model of the electron within the atom, which talks about electrons as probabilistically distributed over space, more like clouds than points, more like waves than particles in some ways, for example. And then there's the Lewis structural model, where we started using dots and lines and letters to represent the positions of electrons and nuclei in molecules. The dots and the lines suggest very much a particle-like representation of the electron. And while the Lewis structural model works for many molecules, it has severe limitations for certain types of molecules where the delocalized nature of electrons in the molecule really comes into play. We're going to look at two examples of molecules characterized by electron delocalization at the start of this video, and then we'll understand, and through looking at those, we'll begin to understand limitations of the Lewis model, and then we'll dig into the concept of resonance and understand how we can extend the Lewis structural model, allowing a single true structure to be represented by multiple resonance structures through a kind of weighted averaging to see how we can keep the Lewis structural model as a very useful formalism while understanding its limitations and being able to push it just a little bit to represent molecules with delocalized electrons, which is impossible using a single Lewis structure. So to introduce the, these ideas, I want to start by looking at two examples of molecules characterized by electron delocalization. The first is the nitrite anion, NO2-. Here's a structure for the nitrite anion. Now, non-bonding electrons are not shown, but we can see the nitrogen atom at the center and the oxygen atoms connected to that central nitrogen. O3 on the right is connected to N1 through a double bond, and O2 is connected to N1 through a single bond. And there's formal negative charge on oxygen 2, and oxygen 3 is formally neutral. Now, Naively, very naively, on the basis of the bonding pattern alone, we can make some predictions about the structure of this molecule. For example, we can look at the fact that there's a double bond between nitrogen 1 and oxygen 3 and predict that this bond should be a different length than the N1O2 bond. In fact, the N1O3 bond should be shorter than the N1O2 bond. We can also make a prediction about the charges on each atom. And here we're not talking about formal charges. Here we're talking about the partial charges calculated by taking the negative charge associated with the electron clouds surrounding an atom, say oxygen 2, and subtracting the positive charge of the nucleus. We should expect the partial charges to be different based on this structure, right? Since O2, first of all, is formally negative, negatively charged, while O3 is neutral, and they have different bonding patterns, different numbers of non-bonding electrons, all that good stuff. What I've done here is drop nitrite into WebMO, which is a quantum chemical calculator that I can use to optimize the geometry quantum mechanically, essentially solve the Schrodinger equation as best I can for this molecule, optimizing the positions of the electrons and nuclei in the process. When I do this and I look at the partial charges, something remarkable pops out. Contrary to our prediction based on the Lewis structure alone, the partial charges on the oxygen atoms are equal to one another. They're both negative 0.6. And so the Lewis structure appears to be an inadequate representation of this molecule, right? Negative charge doesn't live on one or the other of the oxygens. It's spread out equally over both oxygen atoms. This happens because of electron delocalization, and it highlights the limitation of the Lewis structural model, that in having to lay electrons down as dots or lines on or between atoms, we are not able to represent electron delocalization in molecules. Another prediction we can make from the structure is that the two bond lengths are unequal, as we said, and although I won't show this explicitly, you'll have to take my word for it, the bond lengths here are actually equal. The N1O3 bond is equal in length to the N1O2 bond in the optimized structure. This too follows from electron delocalization. The two oxygen atoms are equivalent in their electron densities, and so they have equal bond lengths to the central nitrogen, despite their apparent difference in bonding in the Lewis structure. The bottom line is, a single Lewis structure is not adequate to represent the true structure, the quantum mechanically optimized structure 
of the nitrite anion. The structure that solves the Schrodinger equation cannot be represented using a Lewis structure. The same is true of the carbonate anion, CO3, 2 minus. We can make very similar predictions and observe very similar violations of those predictions in this structure. So for example, we would expect the O2C1 bond to be very different from the C1O4 and C1O3 bonds, with this bond, this double bond, being shorter than the single bonds, with more negative charge on oxygens 3 and 4 than on the neutral oxygen 2, and all that good stuff. Well, watch what happens when we examine the partial charges uh, on the oxygen atoms of carbonate. Sure enough, just like the case of nitrite, the negative charges on the oxygen atoms are equal. They're all equal to negative 0.9. So all three oxygen atoms appear equivalent on partial charge. And again, although I won't verify this for you, you, you can take my word for it, all three bond lengths are equal despite the apparent difference in bonding pattern. The C1O2, O3, and O4 bonds are equivalent in terms of their charge distributions and their lengths. So again, one Lewis structure is inadequate to represent the structure of CO3 2 minus. In the remainder of this video, we'll see how we can use the concept of resonance to reconcile the Lewis structural model, which is very useful as a me measure for understanding where electrons are located in a rough sense and for pushing electrons around, and electron delocalization, which seems to directly contradict this idea that we can represent an electron as a dot on a piece of paper. By using multiple Lewis structures, in a weighted average sort of way. Understanding that the true structure is a weighted average of multiple Lewis structures, we can represent electron delocalization using a collection of Lewis structures known as resonance structures. So resonance as a concept is relevant to molecules that contain delocalized electrons. And while we won't get into here how we can recognize that a molecule has delocalized electrons, I have some videos in my Organic Chemistry 1 playlist that I'll link out to that can give you some more details on that. For the time being, conceptually what we need to understand is that delocalized electrons cannot be represented on a single Lewis structure robustly. In order to depict how electrons are delocalized while still retaining the Lewis structural formalism, we make use of what are called resonance structures. These are multiple structures that are each understood to be an incomplete representation of the molecule, but which, when taken as a whole, and thinking about the true structure as a weighted average of those resonance structures, do very well approximate the true structure of the molecule. So the true electron distribution, for example, is an average of the electron distributions implied by the resonance forms. So let's take a look at Lewis structures of the nitrite anion. Its two most important resonance forms, or most significant resonance forms, are shown for you here. First, let's lay down the formal charges. In the structure on the left, the left-hand oxygen has negative charge. In the structure on the right, the right-hand oxygen has formal negative charge, and the other atoms are formally neutral, and you can verify this on your own. Now let's look at the structural differences, the differences in bonding patterns and the positions of electrons in these two structures. It becomes apparent that there's a double bond between N and the right-hand oxygen in this structure, whereas there's a double bond between N and the left-hand oxygen in the structure on the left. And the number of non-bonding lone pairs on each oxygen has changed across the two structures, gone from 3 to 2 in the left-hand oxygen and 2 to 3 in the right-hand oxygen. Combining these observations, we can recognize that in order to interconvert the left-hand and right-hand structure, we can start, for example, with the left-hand structure, push a pair of electrons from oxygen on the left between the oxygen and nitrogen, and take one of the double bond pairs of electrons and push it onto the oxygen on the right. This produces the structure on the right with those electrons highlighted in purple in these new positions that you see right here. So resonance structures are interconverted by pushing electrons like this, typically non-bonding electrons and electrons involved in double and triple bonds, although as a point I make in my organic courses, this is not a strict requirement by any means. A few things that we can recognize appreciating these two structures as essentially 50% each of the true structure. The first thing is that the negative charge is shared equally by both oxygens. In one resonance form, in this half of the true structure, negative charge is on the left oxygen. But in this half of the true structure, negative charge is on the right-hand oxygen. 
And these are equal in weight because the two structures are superimposable. They are able to be overlaid perfectly so that all of the atoms, electrons, bonds, formal charges are lining up perfectly. So negative charge is shared equally by the two oxygens, and we saw that in the quantum chemically optimized structure earlier. The other thing to note is the bond order between nitrogen and the two oxygens. Both of the NO bond orders are 1.5, because in 50% of the true structure, we have a bond order of 1 between nitrogen and oxygen, and in the remaining 50%, we have a bond order of 2. And of course, the same argument applies to the other NO bond. So both bonds have an overall bond order of 1 plus 2 divided by 2, right, if we think about averaging over both of these, or 1.5. So the parameters of the true molecule can be actually calculated mathematically if we know the weights of the resonance structures just through a weighted averaging process. And this is complicated when the structures are not equivalent, are not superimposable. That's what computers are for. That's what quantum <laughs> computational chemistry packages are for. Um, but we can do this in a rough way when we're dealing with equivalent resonance structures using the idea of each of these is 50% or for three resonance structures, for example on this slide, each of these is 33% of the true structure. Now we can take the resonance structures and sort of smear them together and get a representation that looks very complicated, here it is for carbonate on the right, but tries to represent that quantum mechanically optimized structure as best we can. That structure that is an averaging or a smearing of the resonance structures is called the resonance hybrid. And it's characterized typically by dotted lines for partial bonds, places where electrons come in and out of bonds as we interconvert the resonance structures, as well as partial charges, delta minus and delta plus. So here, for example, to represent those equal negative charges on the three outer oxygens of carbonate, we're using delta minus symbols and the overall charge of negative two is up here in the top right as we would draw for any Lewis structure of the polyatomic ion. So this resonance hybrid structure you can think of as an average or a smearing of the three resonance forms of carbonate. And notice here that we have negative charges on all three of the oxygens over all three structures and so understanding the molecule as an average of these three structures helps us appreciate how all of the oxygens are equivalent in negative charge. I'll leave it up to you to determine what the average charge is on each oxygen by averaging over these three equivalent superimposable resonance forms. And likewise, all of the bond orders are equivalent. Again, it's a nice exercise to focus on one of the CO bonds and determine the average bond order over all three structures. All three CO bonds are equivalent, so this will work for any of the CO bonds that you choose.